Alrighty, guys. So we are going to be uh, jumping into the book of Jude, and uh, we're going to be uh, taking a, a kind of a, a slightly different direction than we than we normally do um, in kind of approaching these books. Um, kind of hitting a hitting and focusing in on a, a different theme. Um, but how I want to start it out is I want to ask you guys a couple questions, and so just answer anything that's applicable. Um, what do you guys know about Peter, the Apostle Peter? He was stubborn. He had a temper. He was a fisherman. What else? He cut some dude's ear off. Yeah, we have a lot of stories about Peter. What about, uh, what about Paul? What do you know about Paul? He killed Christians before he was converted. Yeah, what else? His old name was Saul. Spent a lot of time in prison. Wait, What? Spent a lot of time getting out of prison. Yeah. Almost died several times. All right, what about, what about John, the one that writes, you know, the book of John, 1 John, 2 and 3 John? He saw the future. He, he wrote the book of Revelation. He had that vision from God. What else from John? What was that? Oh. Surprisingly humble. Yeah. He was the one whom Jesus loved. Yeah. Um, now, what do we know about Jude? He was, his name is Judas, yes. No, that's true, not the same Judas. And he was Jesus' brother, half-brother. What else? He wrote this book. Yeah, and that's kind of what I'm getting at here, is that if we would have kind of sat with Pat Peter or um, Paul or John or, or some of the other authors of the New Testament, we could have continued to describe a lot of things about them. We, we, we know a decent amount about who they were. Um, even just outside of uh, most of them, at least the, the other three, writing a lot more New Testament books. And for Jude, we just, we have a couple references. We know that he's Jesus' half-brother. We know that his name is um, actually um, Judas, but then kind of translated is, is Jude. Um, and, then, uh, and, and then we know that he wrote this book. We don't know that much about Jude. Um, and one of the amazing things about Scripture is that it is God-breathed, it is inspired, it is inerrant, it is guided through uh, the Holy Spirit. And, and if the Holy Spirit had a pen writing God's word, it, the Holy Spirit used these different men to do it. And one of the things that's really cool about that is when we read uh, some of Paul's writings versus some of John's writings, we can, we can tell a difference, right? Um, those of you who are familiar, you can tell that there's a different writing style there. There's a different, um, sometimes a different passion that is evident. Uh, there, there's, there's different concerns, different kind of ways of encouraging. And we see that this, there's this kind of human aspect to the writings of these New Testament letters. And it's still inerrant. It's still God's word. But, um, but it, it's really cool. And um, as Professor Lay said a couple weeks ago, um, sometimes these letters, or a letter in general, will almost say more in between the lines than it does within the lines, right? Because if you get a letter, you know, you, you, you have all the context of the other side. And so I find this to be a really fascinating aspect of the New Testament in that, uh, oh man, I got this new little thing. It's supposed to hold this on me. It is not doing it. You guys have seen us all semester just messing with this thing. I apologize. All right. <laughs> Maybe that'll work. But one of the fascinating aspects of the New Testament letters to me is that it shows a side of someone that like, the, the public wouldn't necessarily see, right? When you write a letter, it's, it's something personal. Um, and I think that's why historians and, and, and other people kind of freak out when you find like a letter written by Teddy Roosevelt, right? You know, a personal letter to a friend. Or, or uh, you know, people really like it when they get an inside glimpse into a letter that a president writes. Like maybe to, you know, somebody who's, 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 uh, whose son or daughter w was, was killed in combat and the president writes a letter. Or, or to a sick child. It's like we see this kind of side that you wouldn't necessarily see um, it, without that. I think it's the same reason why uh, Lord, of the Ran Lord of the Rings fans uh, get really pumped about Tolkien's uh, publications that have come out after he's, he's died, right? It's, it's things that were, he had written, and, and they have kind of finished them and kind of brushed them up, right? And, and then they, they, uh, they published them so that people could read them. It's the same reason why we uh, collect and publish and read, like, any scrap of writing that ever graced C.S. Lewis's desks, Right? It, we, we get excited by some of these things if, if you're kind of into that because it shows something different. It shows something that not everybody sees. And this is kind of what I was thinking about as I was reading through Jude because we know a lot about Paul. We know a lot about John. We know a lot about 
uh, Peter and, and other people in the Bible. We don't know a whole lot about Jude. And so as I'm reading through, I'm kind of thinking about this, and I'm kind of thinking, what, what is Jude's passion? What, what is it that motivates him? What is it that, that spurred inside of him the, the type of active faith that, that garnished him to be a, a leader in the early church? What, what was it that, that, that made Jude Jude, essentially? And so I'm, I'm kind of reading through the book of Jude for like the thousandth time or whatever it is, and, and I'm kind of thinking these things, and I'm, I'm reading in verse 1, and I'm seeing kind of Jude's humility in his, in his uh, uh, introduction, and, and then I'm reading in verse 3, and he's talking about how he was eager to write to them about their common salvation. And, and, and then he, he talks about in verse 4 about how he, he kind of found it necessary to write um, more of a warning instead. And all of a sudden, it kind of it jumped out at me. It kind of hit me, is that Jude has a passion. He has a heart for discipleship. Jude has a heart for the strengthening of the body of Christ. Jude has a passion for instructing and, 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 and uh, strengthening the heart of the church. And so I want, what I really want to focus on in the letter of Jude is, is kind of just that. It's kind of a template that Jude uh, gives us for, for us today in terms of discipleship. And so I know that discipleship can be a little bit of like a buzzword or like a Christian cliche, um, or, or you, know, you might describe it as Christianese. You guys have heard that before, but, uh, and, and there's a lot of different definitions of discipleship too, and um, there's kind of a lot of right definitions too. It, it's kind of, it can be broad, because the Bible doesn't give us a, it doesn't say, here's the definition of discipleship. There it is. Um, and so uh, what I want to do tonight, though, is I want to uh, briefly talk about where we get the word disciple, discipleship or discipling from. Uh, I want to give us a, a short, easy, workable, doable um, definition of discipleship. And then I want to work through the book of Jude and pulling out kind of Jude's heart for discipleship and the kind of the template that he lays down for us that we can then emulate together. And so uh, the, where uh, discipleship comes from, kind of the idea of discipleship, is from some of Jesus' last recorded words in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Great commission, right? A lot of you have heard that verse. He says, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples, all of you, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so Jesus essentially is, is, is telling his disciples, he's saying, Go make other disciples, baptize them, teach them. And essentially what Jesus is doing is he's saying, you know, hey, th these are some of my last words here. And he's, he's talking to his disciples and essentially he's saying, uh, remember what I did for you, right? Remember how uh, you came alongside me and you followed me and you watched me preach and you watched me uh, talk to people and you watched me discuss with people that wanted to learn and people that didn't want to learn. And, and I encouraged you and I taught you and I admonished you and I corrected you and I, I sent you out to go do things and then came back and, I, and I, I gave you critique. And Jesus is saying, remember how I taught you. Remember what made you a disciple. And now go do that to other people. And this is the kind of the imperative part of discipleship. A lot of times people think, oh, well, discipleship really isn't for me, right? Or, or I, I don't really need to work to a place where I would someday disciple someone. But if the disciples had, had followed every single thing that Jesus told them to do, every single thing except for this, we would not be here today. The disciples made disciples, and then those people made disciples. And the whole idea of discipleship is that we are passing on the bloodline of our faith but not the genetic bloodline, not the, the physical bloodline, but what we're doing when we disciple other people, when we disciple those who are younger or, or less mature in the faith, we are passing on the lineage of our faith to future generations. And that's exactly what the disciples did. And so here's our definition for discipleship. Um, and we'll work with this. It's on the U version. If, if you have that, um, if you want to write it down, this is it. Discipling is deliberately doing spiritual good to someone so that he or she will be more like Christ. Discipleship is deliberately doing spiritual good to someone so that he or she will be more like Christ. Um, so my definition comes from uh, this book right here. It's Mark Dever's book. It's called Discipleship. It's aptly named. Um, it's short, as all books should be, and, uh, and it is very actionable. 
Um, this is a book that, that we have been going through as, as a staff and working through together. Um, and, then, and then this semester, we've been working through this book with our officer team. And uh, it's part of what has kind of spurred our, you know, our, our student discipleship program. And it's kind of part of the, the, the main thrust of, of the leadership of CCF um, for, for this year and, and probably for um, a while. And um, I'll be kind of borrowing some concepts from this book as I find some commonality with this book and, and, and the book of Jude. Um, but if you're actually, if you're interested in this book, if, you, if we get done tonight with, with this sermon and you're like, you know what, I think I, I want to, I want to, be mature. I want to know about discipleship. I want to know how to do this. I have a couple extra books, I believe, um, that I might be willing to give out. So um, come and talk to me afterwards. But back to Jude. Again, so we're going to, we have our definition. We know where it comes from. It's Jesus's command. And what we want to do now is we want to see how Jude was discipling this church. What did he do with this church, these believers that he wrote to, that made it discipleship? And how can we emulate that as well? So Jude, verse 3, is where I want to kind of hit in on. It's the verse that popped out to me when it kind of stuck out to me as, oh, wow, this is, this is one of Jude's main themes. This is something he's passionate about. Um, just in the same way that, that John was passionate about uh, love and walking in the truth and things like that, Jude is passionate about this. So it says, Jude, verse 3, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation— I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were des designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of God, of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. And so in Jude 3, we see that Jude has this kind of spirit of discipleship evident in the beginning of, uh, of his letter. He was eager to do spiritual good, Right? He said, beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation. Now, he was eager to write to them a letter of encouragement. And so going along with our, our definition, he was eager to do spiritual good in the lives of these believers. He was eager to encourage them in the faith. And so let's kind of jump in to the book of Jude and, and see what we can learn from Jude about discipleship. Now, the, the first thing that I want to talk about is um, the idea of humility and discipleship. If you're going to be discipling somebody, um, it's not a prideful endeavor. It, it's, it's a humble endeavor. And uh, Mark Dever actually talks about in his book, he talks about some of the uh, objections that people have to discipleship or about the idea of discipleship. Um, and one of the things that he lists is, is that people feel like, you know, it, it, it sometimes comes from a prideful place. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll grant you that if you've thought that. Um, and if you're going to be discipling somebody or you have a desire to disciple somebody and, and it comes from a spirit of pride or it's something that you're prideful about, then you shouldn't be discipling somebody. Um, you, that, that's not something that you should be doing at the moment. But, but Jude comes and he starts this kind of level of discipleship. He starts this relationship through his letter. He, he enters in through a spirit of humility. And I want to highlight this in, in Jude verse 1. It says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, and brother of James. Now, what did Jude not say? He didn't say the brother of Jesus, did he? Now, Jude could have claimed, Jude, the brother of Jesus, leader in the early church, pastor of the church of whatever, we don't know, he probably was. And he could have listed all of his titles, right? Like you guys do on the, at, the end of your, at, at the end of your emails. <laughs> I never even knew that was a thing until I started working here. And you guys are just like, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, man, what do I put on there? Nathaniel Kaufman, Fisherman? I don't know. Um, but he, 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 he could have appealed to the, the, the things that, that give him authority, right? But instead, what does he say? He says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ. That's humble. Jude, a servant of my brother that I grew up with, Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's the Messiah. Why? Because he's Lord. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. And so he doesn't hide the fact that he's, uh, that he's, you know, the brother of Jesus. I mean, if you knew him, you knew James. James was the leader of the early church. He was pretty well known as the, the brother of Jesus. Um, he doesn't hide it. He has a certain level of authority that kind of comes with that. Um, but he, he could have came at it a very different way. 
He could have identified him, uh, himself in a different way. And I think when we talk about discipleship, I think that the humility that Jude portrays is an absolute necessity if we're going to, to want to or try to disciple other believers around us. Paul says, imitate me as I... As I what? Imitate me as I imitate Christ, Right? It's a pretty well-known saying that, that, that Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Um, and I think what Paul is doing here in, in reference to discipleship is he's making two main points. First, Paul is acknowledging the need for a contemporary model for Christians to follow. Paul is acknowledging that Jesus is no longer walking and living among us, and so he's acknowledging that, that we, we need and we want, and it's good for us to have older, mature, uh, more mature believers to, to look at who are also following Christ and saying, okay, I can follow th that person because I know that they're doing their best to follow Christ. So Paul is acknowledging the need for that. And then, and then secondarily, Paul is, is uh, acknowledging the, the basis of his ability to do anything. He's saying, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Imitate Christ. He didn't say, imitate me, period. Paul said, because I imitate Christ, Right? So Paul is acknowledging the, the importance of humility, the importance of a, a focus on the gospel, the importance of a focus on Jesus. Paul would have no grounds to even say imitate me if it were not for Jesus, if it were not for what Jesus did in his life, if it were not for Jesus, what Jesus is doing in the lives of the believers that he is writing to. And so I think that humility in discipleship comes through a focus on the gospel, a focus on Christ. And so if you're sitting here tonight and you're like, all right, you know, I, th I think maybe discipleship, you know, deliberately doing spiritual good to someone so that he or she will be more like Christ, I think that's something that I can do. I think that's something I'd like to do more, and I'd like to, to come at it with a spirit of humility. This is how you do it. You focus on the gospel. You focus on Christ. And I want to look at how Jude does that throughout the book. Verse 1, you know, of course, he describes himself as a servant of Jesus, and then in, in verse 3, he's, he's, he's saying, I was eager to write to you about your, our common salvation. He's, he's, he's pointing people back to Jesus. And then in verse 21, he says, uh, he says keep, yourselves, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Then verses 24 and 25, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen. So all throughout this book, beginning, middle, end, Jude is appealing to Christ. He is going back to Christ. He's guiding his, his audience, the, the people who are kind of under his stewardship. He's pointing them back to Jesus. See, the gospel is the basis through which Jude has the ability to disciple in humility. And the gospel is the, the same basis that we have to be able to really do anything, but to be able to disciple without a spirit of pride. Because in the same way that God loved us, we can also love others. In the same way that God has bore, bore with us in our sins as we're trying to, to grow in him and, and trying to become more like him, God is bearing with us in our sins. That's what gives us the ability to bear with one another in their sins against us, right? In the same way that God forgives us, it's the same reason that we're able to forgive other people. Otherwise, there's no reason to do it. And so the gospel is our focus, our primary focus in discipleship. And if we're not focused on the gospel, we'll be saying imitate me instead of imitate Christ. The second kind of connection that I want to pull out from, from Jude is, is, is in verse 3. Jude has a legitimate concern, a genuine concern for the believers that he is writing to. It says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So this is the verse where we see Jude's concern. You know, he, he states his, his reason for writing, but we see his concern for the fellow believers. He was eager to just he just wanted to do something good. He just wanted to, to encourage them. There wasn't even a real reason for him to like, it wasn't like there was this like huge problem that he knew about, and then he's like, okay, I gotta like handle this situation. No, he just, he said, well, I, was, I wanted to write to you guys and encourage you in the faith. 
But then as I like heard about what was going on, I found out that I really needed to write to you about something else. And so Jude has this legitimate concern, and he sees that something is is pertinent to the lives of these believers, and he acts upon it. In verse 4, Jude sees that the people within the church are are perverting God's grace, using it as a license to sin. It says, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So not only are they perverting grace and using it as a license to sin, but they're, they're denying Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus is God. Jesus is king. All right, that's my only Kanye res- reference. I had to get it out. Jesus is king. Um, man, you guys are not on top of it. Are you even listening? <laughs> Have you guys heard the CD? Pretty good. <laughs> I'm not a music person. The album, whatever. <laughs> now you're listening. All right, so Jude had a legitimate concern for the lives of the believers around him, right? Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25 says, and let us not consider... And let us now consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. All right, did you guys catch that? What what did the author of Hebrew, what, what is he commanding us to do? He says, consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, encouraging one another. It's almost as if Jude already knew this, right? He was already on top of it. This is exactly what Jude was doing. Let us consider how to spur each other on towards love and good deeds, meet together, encourage one another. He had a concern. Jude had a concern, and he followed it up with action. My friends, if we're going to disciple, we we have to have a genuine concern for the body of Christ. We have to have a genuine concern looking around us at, at, at the believers around us, and we have to genuinely care about their spiritual health. Discipleship is deliberately doing spiritual good so that he or she may become more like Christ. So this kind of leads us to an application, and and really the application is found in exactly what Jude did. And now it's safe to say that Jude probably, he probably uh, was meeting with people on a regular basis. Um, He probably was doing something a little bit more like what we typically think of when we think of discipleship, right? Right? He probably was meeting with people and studying through God's word and praying and things like that, but, but what did Jude do here? He wrote a letter, right? Jude wrote a letter to these believers. Now, that's not something that we usually think of when we think of discipleship. When we think of discipleship, we don't really think about somebody writing a letter to encourage somebody about their common sal- salvation or, or writing a letter to appeal to them to contend for the faith that was, that was given to them. We don't really think about that. And this is why I like Mark Dever's simple definition, intentionally doing spiritual good to someone so that he or she will become more like Christ. Because it's, it's, it's pretty actionable, right? It doesn't, it doesn't need a, a huge, long, you know, like big program. And, and I'm not saying that those things are bad. Those things can be really helpful. But, but the simplicity of doing spiritual good to someone is, is pretty accessible. And in a day and age where it doesn't take a week's worth of uh, wages to, to write and send and deliver a letter... Um, think about the potential that we have to disciple in a similar, similar way that, that Jude did. So I want to ask you guys, are, are, are there people in your life that, that you could, could be more intentional with? Are there people in your life, friends from back home or friends from here, that, that could, could really benefit from some spiritual good, from a, a, few, a few more regular texts from, from you? Are there family members that you have that, that are maybe struggling? Or maybe they're not struggling, but, but you're more mature in the faith and, and a few phone calls a, a month could, could really help them. A few phone calls where you're praying with them and you're intentional about what's going on in their lives and maybe you're sharing with them what, what's going on in your life. Are there, are there people that would really benefit from that? There's probably people in your life, no matter where you're at in your walk with Jesus, that you can do deliberate spiritual good to so that they will become more like Jesus. It's a really simple definition, and and, and that's why I like it so much. As a body of believers, we really really need to be doing these things, and I I really hope that that this definition is not only something that seems doable, um, but it that, the definition of discipleship that we're working with, along with, with Jesus' command to do it, I, I hope that it's something that, that feels um, 
accessible to you, but also is, is something that feels imperative to your life as a believer. And so a, a, as we move into kind of the, our last main point um, for the book, and you guys are like, man, he's only on verse 3. What's going on here? I'm going to be here forever. Um, we're going to be kind of skipping some of the, the main section of the book. And uh, I apologize for that. We just don't have time to really get in, into like every single verse of the letter. Um, and, and, and Jude, if you're reading through uh, verses, you know, 5 through 16, uh, have some really interesting stuff in them. Some really uh, crazy metaphors, some really interesting uh, references. All of you guys are like now jumping back. You're like, oh, what, what are they? Um, there's some really interesting theological ra- rabbit holes to run down, and I'd love to run down every single one of those with you until we uh, pass out from exhaustion. But uh, what I really want to do tonight is I want to maintain our focus on on this theme of discipleship that we, we see in the letter. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of summarize these little sections here so you at least know what's going on. Um, verses 5 through 11, Jude essentially gives seven examples of people who, who wander away from the faith. Um, and he kind of hits the full gamut. He, 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 he gives examples of, of people or groups of people that are, are within God's community of people. Um, he gives examples of those who, who presumably were once a part of and then now not part of God's people. And then he gives examples of, of groups of people that, that uh, were presumably never in any sort of community of God's people or, or ever within God's grace. Um, and, and Jude's main point here is to show that all who rebel against God, all who pervert God's grace as a license to sin, all who speak against the authority of God will be judged in the same way. Um, and it doesn't matter if they are, come from the community of, of believers or if they are complete opposite. Um, God's judgment is, is, not, is impartial, um, and, and, and they all come to the same end. And so then in, in verses, uh, uh, verses 8, through, uh, 8 through 16, or maybe 12 through 16, Jude kind of moves into a barrage of, of metaphors to, to describe um, what these false teachers would be like, or what these people who pervert God's grace or deny the authority of Jesus Christ as God and King, what they are like. And uh, it's, actually a really, uh, it's actually a really cool way that Jude does it because um, he doesn't attack like a specific form of heresy and kind of like theologically pick it apart and sh- show why it's wrong. But instead what he does is he kind of gives a theological description of people who, who, uh, who fall into these categories of perverting God's grace, denying the, the kingship of Jesus. And, and, so, uh, and so what Jude is doing is he's giving us really a timeless model of, of what these people are like. And essentially what he's saying, what it comes down to is that a good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit. And, and that's really what, what Jude is, is, kind of, um, is, is kind of hitting on. And uh, in regards to discipleship, I think that, you know, this is kind of my transition back in. Um, I, I think that what we can learn from, from Jude's, uh, what Jude is writing here is that Jude is really looking at the bigger picture. Um, he, he's really not even getting bogged down in the weeds. He's looking at the bigger picture. He's kind of, he's focusing on eternity, really is what he's doing. A lot of what he's focusing on is, in, is eternity. Um, and what Jude is doing really throughout all the book is he's saying, you know, the end for these people is eternal damnation. And, and the end for us is eternal life with Jesus Christ. And so what Jude is saying is, this is very important. The things that we're talking about, the, the matters that I am writing to you about are dead serious. And Jude kind of ends this section in verses 22 and 23, and I want to read these for you. And I think it shows Jude's focus on eternity, his focus on the bigger picture. It says, And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by flesh. And so what we see here is Jude's eternal focus in the lives of believers. And he gives kind of two main ca- major categories, right? He says, and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. And so the, the first is Jude's call to have mercy on those who doubt. Um, and I can't help but wonder if, if this is of personal relevance and importance to Jude. And we talked about not knowing too much about Jude, but we do know a, a few things. How many of you guys remember that, that in, uh, in the book of John, it talks about a, a story where it's made evident that, 
that uh, Jesus' family, at one point, had their doubts about Jesus, right? You guys remember that story? Uh, there's a point where it's made clear that, that even Jesus' own family, his brothers and his mother, had doubts about whether Jesus was the Messiah. And then actually Paul makes reference in 1 Corinthians to um, Jesus appearing after his resurrection to James, and I think he maybe says the rest of his family. Um, but it's, it's pretty obvious that at that point James is, is converted because then we see later in Acts that James is um, the, the head of the church in Jerusalem, the Jerusalem council, and, and we presume that Jude was converted along with James at that point. But Jude knows what it's like to doubt, right? So what does he say? He says, have mercy on those who doubt. Jude speaks from a really unique viewpoint in that he didn't believe in Jesus until after the resurrection. And you kind of can't give him really too much flack for that. But I think that this is really a key point in looking towards eternity in discipleship. In discipleship, when you're, when you're wanting to disciple somebody, it, you, you disciple in the moment. You're, you're addressing spiritual needs right now, just as Jude is, but the purpose is, is eternal. And, and, and Jude knows that, that the life of the believer, um, if you were to put it on a graph, because you guys like graphs, and there's probably a way for me to say this that is not using a, a theme park reference, but, but sometimes the life of a believer looks a little bit like a roller coaster, right? Is there a term for that? A shine curve. A sign curve. So sometimes it looks like a little bit like a roller coaster, and, and hopefully... You know, we can always look back and say, you know, I'm a little bit further on in my faith now. I'm a little bit more like Jesus than I was five years ago or two years ago or 10 years ago. But, but we know from our own lives and from other people that sometimes it kind of goes up and down. And so Jude is saying, hey, have mercy on those who doubt. Go, come alongside those people in those life circumstances and, and, and having a spirit of mercy, understanding where they're coming from, meeting our spiritual family members' needs, even in their darkest times, even in their times where they're doubting that Jesus is God, maybe even the times when they're doubting that there even is a God or that God cares or that God's gonna do anything about all this bad stuff in the world anyways. He says, have mercy on those who doubt. The second category is those who are wandering away from the faith, Right? And Jude uses some pretty powerful imagery to describe it. He says, he says save others by snatching them out of the fire. I mean, what's that make you think of? Save others by snatching them out of the fire. Jude is using very intentional uh, imagery and metaphor to show that there is an eternal weight to what he is talking about here. That he is dead serious about what is going on here. Snatching others out of the fire. When people are wandering away from the faith. And so I think that, that some of the people that Jude might be kind of talking about here, one kind of category could be um, people who are just less mature in their faith, more newer believers, and, and maybe easily distracted by, by differing beliefs or things that kind of are similar to Christianity, but they're really wholly different. Um, and, 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 and they're easily distracted, easily pulled away. But I think that also Jude can be talking about people who are really mature in their faith, people who have stood the test of time, but, but all of a sudden there's some sort of life circumstance something that, that really hits you hard and, and it makes you doubt, it makes you question, it makes you wonder. And Jude is saying, when, when people are wandering away from the faith, we have, to, we have to be aware. And some of you guys have been there, right? Some of you guys have had times of doubt, intense times of doubt. Some of you guys have maybe felt like you've been really wandering from the faith. Some of you have seen friends or family members in times of doubt, wandering from the faith. I want to ask you guys, when you think about the, the believers, the community of believers in your life right now, when you, when you think about those around you, would you even know? I mean, seriously, would, would you know? Do you have a, a level of genuine concern that, that, that gives you the ability to, to, to really be invested and attuned in the lives of, of the believers around you? Would you know if they were struggling with doubts? Would you know if they were wandering from the faith? How would you even know if you needed to come alongside them in mercy? How would you even know if you needed to, to jump in and snatch them out of the fire? And obviously that looks like a lot of different things, but, but how would you know? Mark Dever talks about in his book, the work of discipling occurs in the present, but it has its eyes set on eternity. 
And in discipling, we address spiritual needs right now, just like Jude is doing, but it's for the purpose of an eternal reward. It's for the purpose of, of an eternal uh, goal. And it's to prevent, present ourselves uh, holy and mature in Christ when, when Jesus returns. Jude offers us some practical advice in discipleship. Practical advice is always, uh, always nice. Um, in verse 21, I kind of want to hit in on verse 20 and 21. Um, Jude gives them some very practical advice, which I think is, is uh, evident of, of what the church needs, um, but it's also uh, evident of what we all need in discipleship and in our own lives. But he says in verse 20, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And so this is where we would say that, that practically, discipleship has to be rooted in God's word and rooted in prayer. So Jude, Jude says, says, be rooted in God's word. Be rooted in, uh, he says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. Be rooted in scripture. And the second thing that he says is praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, praying in the Holy Spirit has the ability to be a really long lesson with a lot of verses kind of coming in, but, but really simply what praying in the Holy Spirit means is it, it's praying in tune with the Spirit of God, with the Holy Spirit. Or another way to say that would be um, praying within God's will. And how do we know God's will? Well, we read Scripture, and then we pray, and then we read Scripture some more, and then we pray some more, right? Right? And that's what, what Jude is doing here, and he's connecting these two things on purpose because Scripture and prayer are kind of the, really the hallmarks of our faith and the hallmarks of, of what we do to be in tune with God. And you see, this is part of the Bible's model for discipleship. This isn't just in the book of Jude. When we're discipling other believers, when we're deliberately doing spiritual good to someone so that he or she will become more like Christ— Part of what we're doing is we're teaching them how, why, when to pray. How, why, when to study scripture, when to go to scripture, where to go in scripture when different things are happening in your life. And I think a really simple way to model Jude's discipleship is to intentionally find people that you can be doing this with. Now I ask the question, how would you know if the believers around you were struggling with doubt? If they were wandering away from the faith? Well, I think one of the easy ways to know is to be intentional about praying with the believers around you, to be intentional about studying God's word with those around you, to be intentional about, about knowing the lives, knowing the struggles, knowing what's going on in the body of Christ around you. You see, Scripture doesn't really give us a, a, a super easy uh, manual to follow, kind of like this book does right here. It doesn't give us a, a book of the Bible that says, all right, this is how you disciple. Here's the 10 tenets of discipleship and you know, systematic discipleship theology or anything like that. But, um, but what it does do is it commands us to do it. Jesus commands us to do it. It does show us how Jesus discipled his followers and then in turn how his followers discipled new followers, right? And that's really where, what we see in, in the book of Jude. In closing, I want to read a short and... and and very convicting passage from Mark Dever's book. He's talking about discipleship, and he's talking about kind of the current state of, of, of the church in America. And Mark Dever, he's, he's, he's not bashing the church, but what he is doing he's saying, is he's saying that there's a problem. He says, Christians join churches and no one comes alongside them. There is no culture of single folks living with families to learn how to serve Christ. No culture of sharing the gospel with international students. Little hospitality. Only occasional invitations to Sunday lunch or Thursday night dinner. No men shepherding their wives and no wives or older women discipling the younger women. No biblical counseling among the members themselves. Counseling occurs only in the offices. No thought of going to a church where the style of music may not be your favorite, even though it serves others. No thought of helping a family or marriage in trouble. Little reaching out to people with a different skin color or accent. Few, if any, young men meeting up together with other young men to study scripture. Now, some of you, not all churches are like that, obviously. Some of you guys have been to churches that, that do a lot of those things very well. But some of you have also been to churches that that paragraph more or less might describe it. And it's not to bash the church, but it is to say that, that this, is, this is not right. 
There's something wrong if that's the case. There's something missing. There's an aspect of discipleship, Christians deliberately doing spiritual good to others so that they will become more like Christ that is missing from the church. I want to end with, with what Jude has to say in verses 22 and 23, if you'll read that with me. It says, And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Guys, just think about how much easier it would be to mentor and train a young believer to be strong in their faith than it is to snatch them out of the fire. You see, this is our call to the seriousness of Jesus' words in the Great Commission. This is our call to be intentional in the lives of other believers. And this is our call to discipleship. Let's pray. Jesus, we come to you now and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word and we thank you that with all of the uncertainty, uncertain things in life and all of the ever-changing things and the things that we can and can't count on in life, that we know we can count on your word. We can trust in its truth and we can trust in its, in its timeless wisdom because it is a reflection of you. God, we thank you for Jude and, and his writing here and we thank you for the, the ways that we can learn how to disciple. God, we thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit and giving us the ability to do deliberate, intentional, spiritual good to others so that they will become more like you. Lord, I pray that this is uh, not just something that I repeated 20 times in the sermon, but it's something that, that sticks in our hearts, God. And it's something that, that out of a genuine concern like Jude, it's something that we decide we want to do. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.